Ready to go. Thank you, Liz. Uh, and welcome every, everyone to the Finance Committee uh, meeting of the 25th of August. Uh, and welcome to uh, welcome to all the staff that are here today. Welcome to our special guests, Bruce Robertson, Tom Phillips, and Bill Walken from JB Weir, and to our independent member of our Auditor Risk, Mr. Douglas. Uh, thanks for coming along and welcome to all councillors. We have online uh, attending this meeting, Councillor Deeker, Councillor Forbes, Councillor Kelleher, and Councillor Lord is involved in as well. And Councillor Hope in one week corner there. So uh, welcome. Thank we you have, for that. That's good. Uh, we any we have no apologies. Uh, we have no pub, not, have not been advised of uh, any public forum. Uh, we have the agenda in front of us that we appear to have no changes, and that will be confirmed. Uh, just remind members uh, of their conflict of interest uh, to stand aside where they believe there may be a conflict arise. So just keep that in mind as you go through the meeting. Um, and we will start straight away into, uh, we have our team from JB Weir have been doing a tremendous job looking after our funds for a number of years. And look, we would uh, really welcome the opportunity for you to discuss what's happening with our fund and what's happening uh, worldwide, I suppose, and let, let us into that picture and see what exciting news you have got for big earnings for the next year for us. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much, much and Bruce. lovely to be here. It's always nice to come down face to face, get out of Auckland. Uh, well, to say that's been an interesting year, Whew, it's been a really interesting year. So, everyone talks about Russia and Ukraine, which we all know uh, what, a, what an ugly story that is, but um, China, Taiwan, uh, the democracy under pressure, Trump coming back to play, global recessions on the Everything's out there. And I've just come back from Europe and the number of conversations that I had over there, what was really interesting was the common theme was actually about the environment, about you know global warming. And I was quite surprised. I thought I was going to hear a lot about uh, Ukraine and Russia and supply lines and everything else. But the big theme over there, and remember they've had a heat wave right through the UK and Europe, was about the environment. So it's been a really tough year. And so... This presentation will give you some good news. Uh, we'll talk about our performance. I'll ask Tom to go through the numbers shortly. We'll talk about our performance up to 30th of June, which, I, as I say, is a tough time, 12 months. But we'll also give some positives because since then we've had a nice rally up in the markets. And Tom can run through and have a look at the asset allocation that we've kept in line with the SIPO. So from a compliance point of view, that's all a good tick. But he'll leave you with some really good numbers against benchmark. Uh, and I think that will, will tell you that it's, it's been a tough year, but the portfolio has been absolutely doing what it's meant to do. And it's been very resilient. But that's looking in the rear min window now. And the key thing, and why we always like to have Phil here, is Phil's got this crystal ball. The type of gives us a bit of a view on the next 12 to 18 months. I think he's got the toughest job in the firm, to be honest. Uh, and it's a pretty you know, murky type of crystal ball at the moment. So Phil will come through and give all those other topics like inflation and interest rates. And the big one is recession. Are we heading into a recession globally? Is there likelihood of a hard or soft landing? And he can talk about and, and, and dig deep down and give his views on that. Um, Phil is outstanding that he, he's got so much knowledge that he reads just about everything that comes through our firm. And uh, it's a tough role. So he'll give you the real platform about looking forward because this is what we want you to leave you with is watch the picture for the next 12 to 15, 18 months out. So without any further ado, Tom, I'll get you run through the numbers. Thanks, Bruce. Um, so I should have said at the outset, Ted, um, are you ever about to have questions as we go through? Or would you rather have them? I thought we'll just what suits your presentation, really. Yeah, we're, we we're fine to have them as we go through it, but no problem at all. It suits. Um, so we're just on page two for those um, who are on Zoom. It just shows the performance. So, um, Really, we've, we've done this by three months, one year, and three years. So, as Bruce said, it's been a tough uh, year. So, when we say one year, these are to the end of June, that your financial period. Sorry, sorry I'm going to give, for the people who are oh. online. Oh, sorry. if you look at three. Bruce, can you click the page through? Sorry, I just think your information is going to be great. Yeah. 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 We're away. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, so um, for this year, obviously, we've, got, we've had a really tough period with portfolios down almost 7%. Um, the benchmarks um, 
we're slightly bit beating the benchmark, but we'd always rather, you know, uh, have an absolute number. Um, for the three year period, the portfolio has done um, just under 11%, and the benchmark is about 6.5%. So you can't quite see there because they're on the zoom there, but the, the far right hand column you can see on your handouts that. Uh, against all the benchmarks over that three-year period, each individual asset class um, is sitting, is, um, sitting um, um, slightly ahead of its benchmark. Um, if we look at the next page, which is page three, which just shows the long-term uh, portfolio performance overview. So this is, again, over the last three-year period or since we came on board um, with OIC, which was in um, February 2019. Bruce, can you just grab me the... Um, um, so this just shows, again, the performance of the fund um, is the dark line here, the dark blue line you can see, and the individual pale blue um, columns, if you like, is showing on a month by month um, performance of the portfolio versus the benchmark. Um, so we're trying to obviously get more blue, um, more blue bars above the line as, as we've got. And sort of you can't see it on here, but the, the far right hand bit here just shows Really, the big jump we've had just in the month um, of July. The re reason I guess we're showing that is, you know, we've got an asset allocation and we and we we try to stick to it, but we make some technical tilts. But just shows the importance of staying invested through these volatile periods, because the portfolio is up about four point two percent for the month of July alone, which is in dollar terms is, is you know I'm just under a million dollars. So we've got back a fair chunk of last year's uh, financial loss just in one month. Well, it's always hard when you have to turn up and you know you've got a fixed financial year that we obviously you know I have to report the numbers on, but it shows the importance of of you know trying to look longer term, three you know five years preferably. We haven't got that much data yet, but uh, you know the longer you're invested, the greater the returns are going to be. So that minus six point seven seven percent total yes. return since over what time period? One year. So, so the, over the last year we've we've lost six point seven seven percent, even though it's gone up four percent. Uh, it's gone up 4% last S month, month of July. It's it's since June. June. So, sorry, oh. your financial year in June, you were down 6.7. Oh, okay. So, so if you rolled that forward, you know, it's a couple of percent back from where we were 12 months ago. ago. Yeah. 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 Oh, and if you go back a year and a half, you'd, you'd be up uh, about mm -hmm. 5 or 6%. It was the first half of this year that we've seen the losses in the market. Last year was a very strong year, as you can see in the chart there. Um, Can I ask a question? Oh, that's no, it's the answer. Uh, yep. Yes. Uh, sorry, I was just going to ask, and I think you might just be about to show it. Uh, remind me of how the portfolio is structured, please. It's a good question, and we'll we'll show that on this chart, which shows the asset allocation. <laughs> so, um, so we've obviously got the investment mandate and the SIPO that we manage the portfolio to. We've got benchmark down here, so. And at a high level, the portfolio is structured 50% towards income assets, which is predominantly New Zealand fixed interest, offshore fixed interest and cash, and then growth assets, which is split between New Zealand equities, New Zealand listed property, Australian equity, uh, and international equities. Um, and so, if you like, um, the neutral setting is 50% to each. Currently, we've got a slight tilt towards um, cash. And that's simply reflective of the fact that we're currently getting just over 3% in cash. And over the last sort of six months, we've had an overweight to cash, which has done a lot better than fixed interest. So in simple terms, as, as yields go up, the value of a bond falls. So fixed interest assets have been going down in value over the last 12 months. So we've deliberately set an overweight cash. In fact, that cash position is now about 9% because we've just sold a bond earlier this month. So we're currently setting overweight cash. Um, and within equities, where we've got an underweight to New Zealand listed property, the reason being it's a, it, um, the returns of New Zealand listed property are relatively similar to those of fixed interest. So again, we're not too happy on those what we call interest rate sensitive companies. And so we're focusing on New Zealand equities, which have sold off a lot. So we've just put an overweight on to New Zealand equities because we think down here they represent pretty good value. Does, does that answer the question? Uh, yeah, that's good. Thank you. Um, so, you know, they, those um, sort of, you know, uh, technical tilts, we, we think are trying to, one, preserve capital value of the portfolio, and secondly, trying to get us, uh, you know, enhanced returns. Over oh, the sorry. Sorry, there is one other question, obviously. <laughs> that 
How have each of those performed over the past 12 months in terms of plus or minus percentages? Um, so if we just go back to page two, <coughs> Uh, uh, sorry, page, page two on the page, page numbers there. Uh, you can see the one year numbers there. So for those in the room, it's the middle column for those on, on, the, um, on the call. So um, for example, cash has done 2.68%. Um, these are one year to 30 June, I should stress. Um, so all the numbers are there on that, in that middle column there on the one year numbers. Okay, thank you. Okay. And that, uh, Michael, this is actually on diligent if you wanted to have a check on that at some stage as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah, so the portfolio that's a two for cash is 2.68% return. Yes, correct. Whereas the bit, what's the benchmark? What's that actually saying there? What does that mean? So, so, the, so if we use that, that as an example, your cash portfolio, the 2.68%. For the 12 months into 30 June. Yeah. The benchmark is on the left hand side. So it's the 90 day bank bill index, which is the commonly accepted cash benchmark. So the 90 day bank bill index for that period did 0.82%. So what, what that has shown is that we managed your cash better than the 90 day bank bill index rate. So you had an outperformance because you've got a relative here. So we did better managing the cash over that period than the benchmark. But we did worse in, in uh, global bonds. Correct. We did worse in we did worse in global bonds. And Australian equities. Worse in Australian equities and, and global worse, equities. Yeah. For that 12 month period. Yeah. Um, but, but we lost down the we uh 13 percent down in real estate. And Oh, I see. But it's not much of an allocation, is it? Because this is weighted towards conservatism. So over a yeah. third of your uh, portfolios in government bonds, I take it. Yeah, that, that's right. So we, we, we've got a 5% neutral weighting to listed property. And we've been underweight, as I said before. So we can't, we've currently only got about a 3.5% weighting to listed property. So we're underweight that asset class. Yeah. Um, um, it, but you know, I would urge councillors, it's easy for me asked to sit here and say this but the one year numbers this is an incredibly short time period to look at investment returns try to focus on the right hand numbers which are the three year numbers yeah okay. just gives more of a time horizon and, and can I ask, sorry, sorry can i ask another question i'm sorry when you have bonds i'd always assume that you purchased them and they offered a particular interest rate um you're obviously trading in them is that right Market. Not uh, necessarily. No, well, some. So we, 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 we generally try to buy bonds when they're first issued, but the price yep. of a bond goes up and down. So, so say, for example, I'm uh, Contact Energy and I issue a bond today that's got a 5% coupon. Yeah. Okay. And that's when, say, the, just to make it easy, that's when, say, the five year rate is at, say, 4%. So you're getting a 1% margin over that. Say that. And so, say that's priced at a dollar. Say that in a year's time, that five-year rate is now 5%. My bond's still paying me 5%. So what's going to happen is that bond may be worth, say, 97 cents in the dollar. So the price of a bond, despite the fact that it pays you the same coupon, so the same physical cash return every six months, the underlying price of that bond can move. Oh, I see. So I've got to measure it against inflation then, do I? No, you're measuring against the market and all your pricing is market to market because the worst thing we could do is come here and put it in as a fixed uh, capital value or a fixed rate where everything is priced off against the underlying interest rate. So that's why your bonds, bonds move just like equities. So if interest rates go up and you're holding a bond, as said, Tom said, at 5% and interest rates go to 6%, your value of your underlying bond will fall back. So the reality is you've got to keep always marking to market. So it gives you the true picture at a set time and so date. It's the value, not the price of the bond, because we've already bought it, but it's the value of the bond. The price in the market. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. There's been, yeah, so there's been yeah. no no defaults. So that's why you worry about when you own a bond portfolio is, is the, the, the company you lend to not paying you the money back. There has been no defaults in the domestic <coughs> portfolio. And from my understanding with the global bond portfolio, which is managed by PIMCO, there's been none in theirs in a huge, big, diversified global bond portfolio. So this is just a, 
evaluation impact from, from movements yeah. and interest rates. And, and, and an example, like in, in the portfolio, if we just pick on one, for example, we've got a, a Westpac bond, so it's a senior bond issued by Westpac. It's got a maturity date of February 2027. It's paying us a coupon of 3.7%. So we know we're going to get 3.7% every year for the next four years. It's currently trading at 95 cents in the dollar, but that bond will pay us back one dollar. We're 99.9% certain that it will pay us back one dollar in, in four years' time, as well as getting that 3.7% coupon. It's just marked, it's, it's trading below its par value at the moment. So are we worried about that on a mark-to-market basis? Yeah, we don't like reporting a loss in bonds, but we will get that capital value back by the time it by the time it matures. <laughs> Does that answer that question? Um, yeah, it does. I, I had misunderstood how you, uh, I didn't realise you were trading in bonds. I assumed that you just bought it and accumulated the interest. I suppose we, we do do that and we'd only be trading the bonds if new opportunities arose or if our interest rate view changed where we might want to um, uh, whether whether a higher coupon bond um, or a better quality bond or um, or uh, a view around the benchmark might change. That's when we might look to to to, uh, to, to trade bonds or, or sell something and buy another one. But typically, we do hold bonds for for a reasonable period of time. Yeah. Yeah. So if you if you look at the three year bond return, for example, um, you know your bond portfolio for bounces <coughs> an outperformance of two and a half percent over the bond index. So that shows that when we when we have actively managed the bond portfolio, we've added two and a half percent effectively of value for that part of the portfolio, which is you know which is over one third of the council fund. And probably also also should say um, we've been underweight this asset class for for some while as well, given our view on rising interest rates and what it does from a mark to market perspective, and we're only now closing that up, deploying some of the cash. And as some new bonds um, in the domestic market become available, we've started to, to kind of close that underweight um, because of where interest rates have now got to and, and some of the coupons that are on offer um, up over 5%, which we think is becoming, becoming more and more attractive. So just to close off, so the key thing there is about the time frame, the portfolios in place, look at it for three years plus, not just one year. The reality over your three year, your benchmarks have all been beaten. So it's about your time frame. It's too short, 12 months or three or three months to really gauge anything in the marketplace. Yeah. Bill, any more questions on that? Right. Well, well, I suppose a comment on that, I, I probably always look at when we do have a bad year, how you reflect on... Uh, how you reflect to a benchmark and you're actually still ahead of the benchmark. So when things are going bad, you've still managed to get us while, while we're still going bad, you're the best of the bad, if you know. Yeah. So to me, that's a plus as well on it. And one, Kevin, just to, to add to that, if we came here for one year and our figures were 10% above your benchmark, we would still say, don't count one year yeah. as, 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 ah, as a starting yeah. point. Yeah, you've got to have a longer range. Yeah. Always a longer time. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Right, so in my turn, so um, uh, very, very keen to keep this as, as uh, informal. So please, please, questions as we go. Um, I have some slides here. I'm not planning on touching on every single slide. Um, but as Bruce and, and Tom have alluded to, and as you would have seen in, I suppose, the one year asset class performance, is one of the, 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 the most challenging thing about investing this year is there hasn't really been anywhere to hide. Um, yes, you could have been invested in cash and obviously you got some return there, but um, whether you were a fixed interest or an equity investor, it's been been a challenging eight months or so. Um, and there's been a lot of volatility and we can blame, as Bruce said, you can blame Putin or you can blame uh, still kind of COVID outbreaks in China and the like. But I think the, the main reason clearly has been inflation and central banks' response to it. So they've... Um, Inflation has clearly surprised policymakers. It surprised the majority of market participants, to be fair. But central banks, I suppose, at the start of this year, realised their error um, in viewing inflation and have had to quickly, I suppose, pull the handbrake to try and reverse policy quite, quite dramatically. And that has been the most painful, uh, I suppose, driver of the volatility and turbulence we've seen across both bond markets and equity markets this year. 
Now, page six or page sorry, page five. Um, oh, my numbers are different. Five. Page five. Remember to do that. Okay, so page five I think sets the scene pretty well. Um, <laughs> that top right hand chart shows the U.S. labor market in in one picture, and I think it's just the perfect way to try and summarize summarize what is a very complex complex problem. Um, Clearly, there's yeah, there's inflation everywhere, um, but where you're seeing it most noticeably uh, at the moment in the US, but also everywhere, is in labour markets. Labour markets are incredibly tight. You're seeing wage wage uh, pressures as a result. And if any of you are in business, no doubt you're noticing that how hard it is to find staff and, and what you're having to pay up. So this this is highlighted in this top right hand chart. The the dark blue line is labour demand. So that's the total number of people employed in the US economy plus job openings or job vacancies. So it's the total labor demand in the US. You can see there that after COVID, a uh, very sharp, sharp fall, it's rebounded very rapidly to a little above where it was pre-COVID. The, the red line is labor force participation or labor supply, total number of workers available. And that's still well below where it was pre-COVID. So there's a huge gap between demand and supply. It's the largest gap in the US ever. So the US labor market has never been tighter. And again, this is US. You could, and every country has got, got its own little unique issues going around, but it's a similar, similar type story. Labor markets are so tight and that's just not consistent with central banks getting inflation under control. That just speaks to clearly the price of labor, which being wages remaining very elevated. So what central banks and the Fed, especially in this case, the Federal Reserve in the US needs to do is close that gap. Now, they can't do anything about labor supply. They can only really control labor demand. So they've got to slow the economy down so that firms either reassess their hiring plans so they decide we don't have 1,000 vacancies now, we've only got 500. Um, or in a more worst case scenario, they actually start to reduce their, their workforce and lay, lay staff off but the ultimately is they need to close this gap. Now, the challenge that policymakers have, and this has kind of been the big issue that markets have had this year, is that policymakers do not know how much they need to slow economies down to close this gap. And because they don't know how much they need to slow economies down, they don't know how far they need to tighten policy to generate that slowdown. So those are the two big questions that policymakers have been grappling with, and they don't know the answers to them. They're effectively looking in the rearview mirror um, at inflation outcomes to try and try and drive that. And it's been markets have been in this nasty feedback loop where inflation has continued to surprise on the upside. Central banks have come out and continue to say, well, that's stronger than we thought. We're going to have to tighten more. Um, and markets have had to price in more tightening and it's caused more, more weakness in asset prices. So that's kind of been the backdrop for the last, at least for the first six months of this year. Um, I suppose my role as a strategist and as Bruce highlighted is it's fine to look in the rearview mirror and describe what's happened. When, when it comes to investing, you don't invest for what's happened. You want to set up portfolios for what you expect to happen in the next six months or the next year or next five years. And the argument I would make is that I think we're shifting out of this kind of nasty feedback loop where inflation has continued to surprise on the up upside. Central banks have continued to tighten and tighten. Markets have increasingly worried about growth. I think we're morphing into something a little bit different. And so I'm looking at different things now, as, as well as inflation, but different things that I think markets are going to focus on in the next 12 months. So that don't think it necessarily makes the world any easier to navigate, but certainly it's a, a, a slightly different than what we've had over the last six months. So we just jump on the next page. Um, the reason I say that is that there are clear signs now that that tightening that is, is getting traction. The gap between demand and supply is closing. Um, there has been improvement around global supply chains, and I'll touch on that in a sec. Um, but on, on that next slide there, there are there, most important, there are clear signs that growth is slowing. Um, you're seeing that around the global manufacturing cycle. You're seeing it in New Zealand in the housing market especially. Uh, but even in the labor market in the US, you're seeing some high profile companies like Uber or Microsoft or Amazon, Tesla coming out saying, you know what, we're going to have to reassess our hiring plans. The world is getting tougher. We don't need this many staff now. We're going to, or, or that many, we don't have that many vacancies and we're starting to cut back. Now, that's a necessary slowdown. It doesn't sound great, 
But that's exactly what central banks are trying to achieve by, by slowing economies down. That's the only way they're going to get on top of inflation, and it does look like they're getting traction. So progress has been made. So that's another reason why I think the next six months, next 12 months are going to be slightly different. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, I'm thinking of our own Reserve Bank, which mm. obviously will follow, you would think, mainstream policies. Um, we have a labour shortage in this country, so serious that we are having to revise continually our immigration targets. Um, is this going to apply to us? It's same, very, very similar story. It's, it's pretty much every central bank is grappling <clears throat> with the same issue, is that labour markets are far too tight and far too tight to be consistent with their inflation mandates. Um, so it doesn't sound a nice way to put it, but in order for the Reserve Bank to get inflation back to 2% on a sustainable basis, we can't have unemployment at 3.2% or whatever it is today. Um, it's the likelihood is that it needs to rise. Now that can be done by less employment. Um, that's the, the more painful way to do it, or it can be done by increasing the labour supply. Um, Sorry, I don't think you meant, understood my question. What I'm saying is, you, you can think of that conventionally in the way you've just described it. We have massive labour shortages in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about raising unemployment rates, um, I'm struggling to see how that's going to work when we don't have enough nurses, we don't have enough hospitality workers, we don't have enough horticultural workers at the moment to do the jobs that are there now. So it, it suggests that they're going to have to continue to hit the economy so that sectors where there might be excess employment, and I'm thinking things like construction, which is where we're heading into now, um, some services related to the housing market, you're likely to see redundancies eventually in there. Um, that's the more cyclical part of the, the country. Now, immigration is a, is a part of the, and that's, that's unique to New Zealand to some degree, is that we our labour force participation is actually at all-time highs. So we haven't had the same issue in the US where people have exited the labour force and haven't returned post-COVID. Uh, we have more an issue around um, different industries are crying out for different sources of labour, and, and the fact our borders have been closed has been an element to that. It's obviously a very complicated problem and no easy solution. But the bottom line is that in order for the Reserve Bank to get on top of inflation, the labour market is too tight. So they're going to have to call it one way or the other. And it suggests that weakness in some of the cyclical parts of the economy, whether it's housing, consumer-related areas, uh, are still in for some tough, a tough period ahead. And then the immigration settings, which clearly the Reserve Bank, again, has no control over. They are a, a, an input into that assumption around where a sustainable level of, of employment and unemployment could be. Um, but that's clearly, clearly changing, um, changing by the day too. Yeah. But yeah, just to, just um, yeah, to, so th there are signs that the traction is working in New Zealand. You're clearly seeing it in the housing market, um, and even in consumer spending, that is that has softened off. Um, globally, you're seeing it too. And and the other issue I think is really important from an investment perspective is that at the start of this year, central banks kind of were caught uh, were, were surprised by inflation at a time when they had policy at some of the more most aggressive levels of accommodation they've ever had. So in the US, the, uh, the official policy rate was zero and they were still expanding their balance sheet. Um, in New Zealand, we, had, we, we were a little bit earlier to tightening, but still had very accommodative central bank policies. Fast forward to today, um, most central banks have now started to tighten very aggressively. Uh, the official cash rate in New Zealand is now 3%. That's above their estimate of, of neutral um, or where it's kind of starting to have restrictive um, impact on the economy. The US Federal Reserve's not far away from that as well. So now we're at a point where central banks have reacted very aggressively. And you can see that on the, the right-hand chart there around policy rates. They're now back up to levels where it, it gives central banks a little more flexibility to respond. Um, just to highlight how, how aggressively, at least in the US, but it's the same again, same everywhere, how, how surprised the market has been by um, I suppose this U-turn from policy, is that left-hand chart shows what the market was pricing in by way of Fed interest rate hikes for this year. And you go back less than a year ago, so you go back to September, so it's coming up a year, 
the market felt that for the Fed to get on in control of inflation, they'd only have to tighten by 25 basis points this year. So one hike. Now, in the end, we've seen this huge big reassessment of, of the expectations and now um, they've already delivered some of this, of course, but now around 350 to 400 basis points of tightening this year. And it's not over. Um, and if that is delivered, it will be the second most impressive tightening cycle in the space of 12 months, uh, other than when Paul Volcker came in, in in the 80s and, and very aggressively uh, reacted. So it's been a, a very significant U-turn. And that's, again, one of the reasons why markets have faced faced a challenge. But we're now in a different, different position. We're, policy is no longer as accommodative as it was. It is getting traction. Um, and... We're further through, I suppose, this painful adjustment adjustment than I think than I think is appreciated. Um, overall. Any better than anyone else's over this period? Um, I'd put my hand up and and say I have I was caught, I've been wrong on inflation. I did not believe it would be as persistent and broad based as it has been. Um, so you were with the market. I would, uh, yeah, to surprised. A, I have been as as, as surprised, and and I think. That's why it's always a little unfair to look back in hindsight and say central banks have done a horrible job. They clearly have got it wrong, but everyone's an expert in hindsight, of course. Um, not that I want to give too much credit to the Reserve Bank in New Zealand because they've clearly haven't done an amazing job either, but at least they saw the problem a little earlier than others. So they started tightening aggressively last year, whereas the Reserve Bank of Australia, I think it was only in March or April this year, they were still adamant that they could keep interest rates at zero until 2024. And again, they've come out and reversed that call. Um, but I suppose the challenge that central banks have, and, and, and economists in general um, have had over the last uh, two years, I suppose, is that this has been a very unique economic shock. It hasn't even really been an economic shock. It's been a health crisis. And uh, first and foremost, it's had economic consequences, of course. Um, but I think when it first hit, everyone thought it would be more of a demand shock than a supply shock. Everyone gets locked in their houses, they'd cut back on their spending, there'd be mass unemployment as people, people stop spending, and, and it would, it would um, be a big deflationary shock more than anything. Now, fast forwarding to today, that was incorrect, very incorrect, to, turned into be a huge supply shock mainly because governments and central banks stimulated economies so aggressively to cushion the blow. When it was New Zealand, they had the wage subsidy. In the US, they handed out checks. In, 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 in Europe and UK, they had wage subsidies and things to, to offset the economic damage. Um, but what we're still living with now is the supply consequences of, of that shock, where yeah, you still have people who are grappling, still at home sick, or are still looking after family members, or have exited the labour force. Um, or there's still factories in China that are, that are closed because they can't find the labour. So that it's the supply consequences of this that everyone's kind of misjudged. And that's, I think, the main problem with inflation is that demand's bounced back very sharply, supply hasn't. And the challenge that central banks have is they can only really control demand. They have not a lot of control over supply, if any. And they have to get demand down. Well, that doesn't control, that just supports demand. That doesn't do anything yes. for supply. So they can supply money. Um, yeah, but again, it's only supply. it's a supply of money, but it's only supporting the demand spending of the economy. It doesn't determine how many um, people enter the labour force. It doesn't determine um, how many ships can be processed through Shanghai port, um, all those type of things. So that, that's been, I suppose, the... Well, again, with hindsight, the, the big error from the economist community and central bank community especially is mis misjudging what the COVID shock represented and the, the, long, the length of it. Um, I don't think anyone was really hoping or expecting it to, to still be kind of doing the rounds um, uh, this, this two years on and on the pandemic. Um, but I suppose, yeah, the point being is that that's kind of where we've been. I'd argue that we're further advanced in that adjustment now than we were. And I think that's really important. If you jump on the next slide, page eight, when you think about market adjustments, and this is largely an equity story here, equities is usually the, the area of your portfolio that has the most risks, most return potential too, but, but most volatility and risk. And when you look back at history and, and try and judge, okay, what are the conditions necessary for equity markets to sustainably rally? Um, when an adjustment and an asset price correction is led by central bank 
or monetary policy, as certainly the, it has been the case this year, usually it takes central banks to say, we've tightened enough, or they start to reverse that. They over, they've overdone it for, for, for markets to say, you know what, we can price in all the economic damage now and then start to price recovery. And I don't think we're there yet. Um, all the rhetoric coming out of central banks, ours included in Australia, Europe, even with, with the challenges going on over there or in the US is saying we still have work to do on inflation. And so um, I can't confidently sit here and say markets are ready to sustainably recover. And that doesn't mean they're going to fall another 20%, but I just think we're not quite ready to say we're, we're, um, they're, they're ready to sustainably recover. And the reason for that is that they still have not got on top of inflation. And that's really where I want to spend a bit of time talking now on the next slide on page nine there. Um, has inflation peaked? I believe it has. And there's some, there's some reasons I can quite confidently say that, is that if you look again, this is US dominated, but it's a very similar story in New Zealand or in other developed nations as well. I use US data because it's the most comprehensive and easy, easy to access. But if you look at that top left-hand chart there, um, this was the reason why central banks initially thought that that inflation was temporary or transitory, is that when the COVID shock hit, um, we didn't households didn't really cut back on their spending. They just changed where they were spending. And that's quite logical to think about. We couldn't go out to restaurants. We couldn't go to the cinema. We couldn't travel. But what we did instead, we stayed at home and we decided, you know what, I need to repaint my house. I need to buy that outdoor furniture. I need to buy a new television or I need, need to buy a new computer so I can act, go to work and access, access the technology that I, that I need. And you can see that at, in that left-hand chart there with a the dark purple line. Well, the purple line there is spending on services and the lighter line is spending on goods or durable goods. Now, why does that matter? Well, goods are stuff that needs, they're trade intensive. They need to be made in a factory somewhere. They need to be put on a ship or an airline, and then they need to be just sent on a truck to your doorstep. Um, the world was not ready for that amount of spending binge on durable goods. And um, that's what caused all these supply chain problems around the world, at the same time as some of the factories were shut um, because, of, because of COVID and supply, uh, labor supply problems. Now we're starting to see that normalize. Um, the US has pretty much reopened now and, and spending on services is almost back to its, what it was pre-trend pre and, and spending, on dur uh, spending on durable goods is eased right back as well because once you bought one new washing machine, you hope you don't have to buy another washing machine for a little bit longer. So um, once you've bought on durable goods, usually you don't have to repeat that spending for a while. Now, why is that important? Well, then if you look at the chart right next to it on the right, uh, break, breaking down um, is CPI inflation. The reason central banks felt that inflation was transitory, you look, look at that light blue line there, the price of durable goods in the US. They went from over the previous kind of decade and a half, typically falling in price to going up nearly 20% year on year as you just couldn't access them. Um, and clearly there was, a, there was a huge price shock, whether it was in car, the car market or, or in other, other big, big ticket items. Now that spending's normalised, you're starting to see the prices of those um, categories start to, to reverse, or at least you're the, getting disinflation in those categories. So the big problem child's initially are reversing. Now the ch challenge that central banks have is that inflation has broadened out well beyond just for cars and for, for washing machines and TVs. It's now in going out to dinner. It's now in going, uh, jumping on an aeroplane. It's now rent. It's, it's in services inflation as well. And you can see that on that chart. So that's why their battle is not over yet. But it still says to me that inflation is, is likely peaked. And not only that, you're starting to see repairing in, in global supply chains around the world as well. Um, but the issue really is, is that it might be quite easy. And I, I actually think this is probably quite likely that central banks could stop doing anything now and inflation falls from seven or eight or nine percent, depending on which country you're talking about, down to four very easily. Getting it from four back down to two, when the labour markets are as tight as they are, um, could be a little bit more of a challenge. And that's that's really the issue now. If you just jump on the next slide on page ten, is that inflation unfortunately has morphed into the more persistent categories. It's in housing, it's in rents, um, it's in your labour-intensive sectors. So this goes back again to that point at the start, that in, in order for central banks to 
to get inflation back down sustainably at target, labour markets are going to have to cool off uh, further than, than what we've seen so far. So progress has been made, growth has slowed, central banks have tightened aggressively, inflation is easing, but has the battle been won? Probably not yet. Um, so it just, it just means I think we're, we're certainly a long way through the tightening cycle, but there's further to go. Um, and I think it's going to still be a little bit of time before central banks can, can come out and say confidently that they've tightened enough. And when they do do that, I think that is certainly, I think, a, a very strong signpost we're looking at uh, to determine kind of where we turn much more positive on, on, um, on growth assets or equities. And you can see, as Tom highlighted, Within your portfolio at the moment, we've got a, a preference still for your defensive asset classes, so fixed income and, and cash. Uh, but also within equities, we've got a preference for New Zealand at the moment. It's a more defensive uh, market versus global in Australia. Um, so that's where we're tilting at the moment, just given, given that macro backdrop. Uh, and it is all summarised pretty nicely on page 11. Again, using history as a guide. Um, this is going back, using, looking again, using the US equity market as a, as a kind of a, a good, a good uh, indication of, of, of globe and, and, and other markets too. Going back to the 1950s, showing the performance of the, of the US equity market when inflation is peaked. And you can see there that when it's peaked, there's a huge divergence in potential performance. But what is typically the, 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 um, the kind of the, the signal of whether you're going to get gains or losses from here is whether growth continues to weaken, whether we can avoid a recession or not. And that's all going to come down to when and central banks feel confident that they've done enough, how much weakness we need to see in labour markets. And I think it's fair to say that, yeah, the path to avoid recession, US is probably different, but for places like New Zealand, given the tightness in the labour market and, and our challenges of finding staff and where inflation is, is going to be pretty hard to avoid. And I think the odds are that we do actually do need to, to, to have that recession, unfortunately, to, to, for the central bank to get on top of inflation. So, so what does that mean? Well, it means we're now becoming more worried about growth and less worried about inflation. It doesn't mean we're not worried about inflation, but we're more worried about growth. And so when we're thinking about deploying capital within equity markets, what it means is we want to be in parts of the market where we have far more confidence and visibility over their earnings profile. Um, not all parts of the equity market are sensitive to the economy. You look in New Zealand, for example, the electricity generators, the biggest driver of their earnings is the weather. Um, if you look at um, the telecommunication sector, again, the biggest driver of their, their earnings is actually quite very insensitive to the economy. But that's, there's parts of the market that are very sensitive to, to, um, to, to the underlying performance of the economy. So where we're, we're hunting and kind of looking for opportunities and deploying capital, re, repositioning portfolios at the moment, including what we've done for, for this portfolio, is positioning into sectors where we have more visibility over, over the earnings. That's companies that have pricing power, that have margin resilience, that have <laughs> typically strong balance sheets. And our most preferred sector globally at the moment is places like healthcare. Uh, we also like parts of the technology sector which are very profitable sectors with high margins and are less sensitive to the economic cycle than, say, construction or, um, or consumer discretionary sectors. Um, and so we've tilted portfolios to, to that more defensive. Um, and it's the reason why we like the New Zealand market or tactically like the New Zealand market at the moment. Um, as Tom highlighted, it's had a tough period um, as interest rates have risen. But if you know anything about our New Zealand equity market, is is almost um, it's 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 indistinguishable from oh, so it's a very very different to the, to the New Zealand economy. It's electricity generators, it's infrastructure companies, it's uh, telecommunications, it's um, it's property, um, and these are quality companies with stable earnings, pricing power, and that's exactly where we're looking at the moment. It's more defensive asset class, and so we've tactically tilted towards. That market in a world where we're a little bit nervous about the, the growth outlook because central banks haven't won that inflation battle yet. So that's really all, kind of all I wanted to cover. I've got some more slides, but I won't go through all those. And like, I'm happy, Chair, to, to take any more questions. Yeah, that's great, great. Tom. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, completely out of left field question, really. And it's not a question, totally either. Um, we 
are now looking at as a lot of places are our global footprint and our carbon everything. Um, presumably part of that is going to be us looking at where we can um, reduce things like the university is looking at whether they need to go to conferences to go and talk about how much carbon is being used in the world and fly home again. Um, so are you in a position to advise us if we said to you, seeing the three of you down here, you're part of our carbon footprint, could we save some money by having you up there on the board rather than down here on the ground? I mean, that might be something we might be looking at if we're looking at, I mean, we are looking at every thing our organisation does that has a carbon footprint. Is that something you would be um, able to produce for us and able to respond to if we just said, how do we reduce our carbon footprint with you guys? How much would it be if we saw you up there, not down here? Um, from an investment perspective, we can definitely, uh, and we have the ability to put portfolios through um, carbon screen so they they show you where you're positioned globally and what those what what your carbon footprint so the, the percentage of carbon um produced i don't think that's the right term your weighted average carbon intensity of your portfolio so for every million dollars you've invested what's your carbon carbon footprint um from kind of a more operationals perspective i don't know if necessarily that would be our area to, to advise you on but certainly from an investment perspective and you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't well, you be could advise us on what you your know, carbon I, I, footprint is coming. You know, I, I think to, to answer your question, yeah. if we didn't fly down, there is, it's it's um, indisputable that they would have a, a lesser carbon footprint. Mm. However, what's the other effects of us? We're, we're great believers in you know a relationship and coming down to seeing you, explain things. And I think we haven't yet got enough data, not just council, but just in life of the difference between fronting up to ask questions like this and on a Zoom. In my own view, is it's going to take 20 years of data to see the downstream effects of life on Zoom or Teams than in person and asking these sort of questions and Council Law's questions earlier. And so what's he, the effect of that? <laughs> he was on Zoom. So, you know, what's the effect of, of that long term on Council, and is that bigger than your ability to offset the carbon? I'm feeling, so that's not a good way of answering. I'm about to leave as a councillor, but I'm feeling that there's some urgent feeling by my fellow councillors about mm. trying to come to the party yeah, I understand that. doing yeah. this. And so I don't think the appetite will be to say, well, let's see for 20 years whether this will be a good or oh, bad yeah, you idea. Know what I'm I mean. just, just, I'm just saying. Councillor Cameron, what I have to say there is that. Um, when we engage these people, um, part of their trip down is just not to see us. So ours would I'm, only be a small correct. portion of the. I'm just. Of the figure, but I understand. I'm just saying that understand. if we're looking at things, we'll be looking at them, and that'll be one of the things I would have thought was easy. Not not just us, but our contract, and you would be a really easy one. Yeah, yeah as exactly. You so. The fact that maybe we haven't been out for a couple of years, maybe yeah. we've got a few credits. <laughs> yeah. 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 But I agree with and, you. And, yeah. and, and, and all and you companies might say are we at. come down one year and three instead of one year. Or, yeah, and, that's, and, and that, that's a compromise. that reduces yeah. it by X amount. Question, and that. Uh, Andrew. Um, could you just remind us in terms of uh, what we are investing in and um, the agreement that we've got with you through the SIPO of, um, or otherwise in terms of those ethical investments mm -hmm. or your other decision making um, around that? Well, the, at the moment, there's no formal ethical policy. Um, um, and yeah, we came down, I'm trying to think of my dates, it would be two. I thought we came down about two years ago. The question was asked, and um, I had a chat with to, to Nick. And something we're doing with our entities is, is really having workshops to work out what, what council's policy is. And how much you want to take that, and whether that we can do that on Zoom or or or, or not. But um, you know, we have a view that uh, in this case, council needs to own the policy. We can't tell you what you can or cannot invest in. And a good example is we often use with councils is councils give out uh, liquor licenses. Maybe not the regional council, but and so it's a matter of so then you know it's like how to hold liquor companies in a portfolio when you're giving out a liquor license. Or, so there's. But you have to own the policy. 
we then implement it and you know implement it and report to you on it. So we're happy to help you in that journey. You can advise us on what the effect of our policy and, and, and we yeah. can and we can show you yeah, similar similar like clients and what they deploy yeah. um, and kind of I suppose what the 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 benchmark for want of a better word is used in the industry. We can definitely deploy that. But yeah, it, yeah like to Tom's point. Well, we yeah. can give you guidelines of what others do to sort of expediate the process. Mm -hmm. Because if what we found is if everyone has their view, then you can either, you know, you then you end up with you know a paralysis. There's nothing happens, but is it becoming more commonplace? Absolutely. 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 And I was just saying that this, this is a comment we're getting from boards all the time. And you know, we're one of the few companies we've got a climate change specialist on board because we are fronting up to this. And just in my trip to Europe, uh, everybody's asked the questions when you've got droughts. Uh, <laughs> no, unfortunately, it wasn't by the drought. But um, the reality is that everybody's asking this. And that's why I say to you, the environmental issues we're at the forefront now. You know, Europe's seen it, the UK's seen it, Australia's seen it, we've just seen it in Nelson. So everybody's asking these questions. And when we look through our JV Wear, we're trying to contemplate, trying to look forward and say, hold up, what can we do 12 to 18 months out? We're, we're thinking about what the future's looking like as well for our clients, because these are the questions being asked. If you go back to 2004, when we talked about ESG, we were at the forefront of it. 2015, we had another big shakeup. We thought, geez, are, are we really delivering to our clients the questions or the answers they're starting to question us on. And so we had one of our clients was up in Harvard and he came back and really gave us a whole lot of good information to make us start looking internally. What are we doing here? So we're at the forefront of that, but it's a changing, you know, it's a changing story as we go along, but we are aware of it and we're taking it on board. Yeah. Andrew? Yeah, a bit of a political question, but um, if you look at probably one of the key drivers uh, for inflation in New Zealand is government spending. Uh, how confident are you? I mean, because obviously you, you feel as if inflation's peaked, etc. Um, the government's uh, ability to pull back. Are you confident that they they are able to play their part in terms of the inflation leveling out and and essentially dropping over a period of time? You're obviously confident about that aspect. Yeah, I think the gov governments have contributed to inflation, but it's not the major cause of inflation. Um, if you think, yeah, yeah the, 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 the counterfactual is if, ha if governments hadn't stepped in and say in New Zealand we hadn't done the wage subsidy or the big the big stimulus packages that you saw then, um, I heaven forbid what 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 state the economy would be in now. The same in places like the US and Europe and places as well. Now, um, the big issue for me around inflation is is supply. So, is government spending, if they're going to continue to spend at, at reasonable rates, are they helping to boost the supply side capacity of the economy? Changing migration settings that obviously absolutely feeds into that. Um, now, this is not something that you, you change easily over time, but just um, one thing I think, uh, um, yeah, governments have to be careful of is um, stimulating the economies even more at the moment where they're so so supply constrained because that does automatically just contribute to inflation. Um, when you look in New Zealand, the the biggest source of domestic inflation. So let's put aside oil and commodity prices and and things that just we, we just can't control. The biggest driver of inflation has been construction costs. They're currently running in New Zealand at 18% year on year. Um, and this is clearly things like your board, but also labor. Um, there is a very strong historical correlation between house prices and construction costs. And at the moment, um, housing nationally is annualizing at minus 20% and continuing to fall. So I feel quite strongly, unless that historical relationship is totally broken down, which I don't see a reason why it would have, why construction costs won't start to ease off very dramatically very soon. And I think that will help help the, the issue for inflation for the Reserve Bank. It doesn't get around the fact that, yeah, there's still pressures in the labour market and wage pressures and, and, and in sectors which are clearly very important from a social perspective. But a lot of the inflation is in housing. And housing is arguably the weak, or not arguably, it is the weakest part of the New Zealand economy right now. So that, that will help with the inflation problem quite dramatically. And anecdotally, you're certainly hearing that um, when I'm going out talking to construction firms and things now, there's no issues around, far less issues around getting access to supply to, to products. 
and you're hearing actually stories now of a few redundancies emerging in, in, in some of the developer space. So yeah, it sounds nasty way to put it, but monetary policy is actually working and doing what it needs to. Yeah. Uh, final question for Brian. Yes. Yeah, just looking to the next step. So we're 50-50 uh, equities versus bonds and cash. Is that still best? That's quite a conservative situation. Is that still a like? Are there any changes you're recommending? We've talked about the makeup of the portfolio, carbon, whatever. Are you recommending any changes to how we're managing the portfolio? No, 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 I don't. I don't. No, no, no. We're not. Um, what was the case when I can talk from a kind of whole client, whole of JDWare client perspective? We rewind a couple of years ago when interest rates were at zero or one percent. Yeah. Um, you there was a, a a a drive for clients to increase their equities portion of their portfolios. Yeah. Now you take on clearly more risk by doing that, but it was all around growing returns. You're clearly not getting any any return from from a bond that's paying a 1% coupon or a turn deposit rate at less than 1%. Now, when fixed interest and new bonds are being issued with coupons at five, six, sometimes even 7%, I think that that argument to increase equities from a strategic perspective is far less pressing. And I think um, for, a, yeah, it depends on your own risk tolerances, of course, but I think 50-50, Still seems like a, a sensible um, position for for OIC, cool. and it's and it's similar for other similar type clients that we have at JB Wood as well. Gentlemen, thanks very much for your time. Thanks very much for uh, look. Firstly, thanks very much for our portfolio performance. And if I look at and I know we're not meant to look short term, but if I look at the two short term terms, we're we're above benchmark, but our three year uh, return is very much above benchmark. So so very very good work, and thanks for doing that. Thanks for taking your time on your multiple trip client multiple client trip south um and uh, we'll be in touch and there's probably some work at audit and risk we need to start looking at uh the makeup of who we are investing in and just ensure that we're happy with that as well so we'll we'll certainly get back to you with some advice around that thank you very much for your time thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks a lot. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Right, carrying on with the agenda to uh, item six, confirmations of minutes. We have uh, two sets of minutes. Uh, could someone move in the direction of those big seconded? Councillor Wilson seconded Councillor Calvert. Forgotten me already. Deputy Chair. Having co-chair. Moving on. Uh, we are uh, item seven. Uh, open actions was for resolving resolutions from the finance committee. Chair, can I just give an update on the action at the top of the page in the environmental program? future options. Um, there was an action there, it has been completed, but uh, back in March, the Mural Forum, um, we um, updated uh, other mayors about what the Embora Schools program was about um, and how uh, we had discussed as a council the potential to increase um, the reach across Otago to more schools, more, more uh, early childhood um, facilities as well to try and deliver a greater um, Envira School program. Uh, our current funding in that space is maxed out. Um, and really the point in raising at the Mural Forum was around, was there a willingness from the mayors of Otago um, to take it back to their councils to potentially 
increase the funding envelope to, to deliver more of a virus schools program right across the region. The outcome of that discussion was that they will consider that through their annual plan process. They've also received the report that Richard um, and his staff produced for us, uh, I don't know, possibly earlier on in the year. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so that's where things are at. Thank you. Any further comments on actions? Sorry, can, can I just clarify? Can you, is there any is there any action on staff then to bring anything back to this council as part of next year's annual plan? Or what? I just want to make sure we don't okay. miss the boat and end up in a position where we're talking about it too late in the planning process. Yeah, we will need to. We will obviously raise it here okay. with, in, in our discussion. Um, but my understanding, I mean, their processes will run yep. uh, independently, obviously, and they've got that background information about the overall costs, yep. uh, additional costs that will be required to have a, a fuller program across their target. But we will have the discussion here if there's any increase for our, uh, our budget. Some of the things in the action plan. And, and uh, so a question to, to Nick, if you're there, Nick, uh, on page 17, um, around ensuring a balanced budget um, and that was one of our auditors requests I just wonder how progress uh, and that's for the next year's budget I just wonder how progress and thought patterns are going around that which page are you on? Uh, I'm on page 17 mm -hmm. on page 3 oh sorry sorry down the bottom I'm sorry I was looking at the wrong page number page oh, sorry thank you yeah I, I mean um this one uh, is just something that that happens with our, our regular, um, you know, financial reporting. So the how we're tracking against the budget will be um, reported, obviously, in the quarterly reports. But um, but within that cycle, obviously, we've got our regular ELT um, review where we're looking at monthly financials, um, and you know the uh, any variances will be discussed there, and then variances up or down would be um, reported through subsequent to that in the quarterly um, quarterly reporting. There's always going to be variances to uh, to the budget, but the um, you know within individual line yeah. items. But the question is, um, or here the the directive is um, the action is to make sure that we keep the overall envelope within that um, you know the budgeted uh, surplus or deficit that we'd set. So maybe maybe. Uh, Pim's got some more he wants to add on it, um, but I certainly see this as uh, this will just be an ongoing action as we report through the year to ensure that we're um, that we're staying within that um, you know the budgeted envelope that we've set. Well, I didn't notice that it was one of my actions as opposed to one of Nick's. So I was quite pleased that you asked the chair of putting that to you, Nick, and it to me. But um, yeah, look. Um, uh, we are working hard. We'll work hard as, as I've always done in every organisation. I've been chief executive of to try and achieve the budget. Uh, uh, there has been one change. I'm getting reports uh, monthly now from ELT members in terms of how they are tracking and their directorates uh, to budget, uh, which we haven't done before. Uh, so we'll be monitoring our budgets close, closely because it's not just the organisation as a whole, it's actually in each of the directorates that we spend the money. And, um, and Nick's job is actually to account for the money, but of course he supports me in his role uh, of ensuring that we've got the information that we know that we're not going over budget uh, needlessly. But, but notwithstanding that, we're in an unusual environment and, and, and we, you guys are aware of some unexpected cost likelihoods over the next, uh, over the next uh, 11 months. Uh, so there's always that risk, I suppose, uh, that we'll manage uh, other than the really unexpected hits that we take, well, and we took some last year in terms of legal costs, um, uh, we'll definitely be working to be within uh, expectations. Councillor Calvert. Um, I think following on from what um, Pim said, that it might be useful to have in um, when a proposal comes to overspend the budget, um, a, where is that money going to come from? Because um, we have been particularly told by our auditors that we are not to overspend the budget. And just to think that it's bad times and things, I'm not saying that that's what you said, but 
but it always is for one reason or another. And we have made a commitment to each other or around this table, I think, to um, not to overspend the budget, to balance it. So that means that if we choose to overspend the budget on something, we have to have a proposal that we're going to underspend it on something else. So we've just potentially thrown $407,000 or something. Or whatever, 400, there we go, half a million. You say it quickly. Um, where's it going to come from? And it has to come from somewhere. And we were told by our auditors that if we do this again, just keep overspending, we will get a mark. You've got a better description of what it is on our audit and that we have been warned that we're not to do that. So we have to find a way of underspending if we're proposing an overspend. Yeah, and, and that's my expectation too. So ultimately, the, the ELT team works together. Uh, their first focus is the organisation as a whole, even though they've got responsibilities for their own budgets, for their, their own directorates. And so, uh, as Nick just explained, all budgets have unders and overs. In fact, the whole concept of a budget is that it's, it's an expectation of how we'll spend money. It's not an actual, you know, that's why we show your actuals versus, versus uh, year to date. Uh, uh, on a monthly basis through our reporting. Um, so yes, my expectation is that my team will work hard to achieve the budget that's in the annual um, in the annual plan. But notwithstanding that, you know, and public transport is one example, uh, we can see that there are you know some unexpected and unplanned for costs, which may or not we may or may not be able to offset. But, but I'd like to give you a bit of confidence that I've never underperformed the budget yet. So um, so while it might be an expectation for RRC to overspend or to, or to, or to um, underperform its budget, it's not my expectation for myself. It's never happened to me. But, I, but I'm just warning you that there are some significant projects that you're aware of that council will have to make decisions around, some of which will have cost implications. So I'm asking the question of whether any time that a proposal for an overspend is happening, whether we could have an explanation of where our budget will underspend to meet it or yeah, whatever. It's not as simple as that because um, in the end you manage your budgets and you expect your staff to manage them as well as they're capable of doing. What's more important is that you're not spending money needlessly in, in places where we're actually not either needing the work or not needing the budget we thought we'd need. So there are overs and unders. So, so, so uh, Potentially, you could go to the point of cutting budgets. If you, if, you had a, if you had a particular shock in a particular area, you could start saying, let's cut some other people's budgets. Um, and I suppose that's a consideration. Um, but, but, but it's not as straightforward as simply saying, unless you're wanting to cut back on your work program, which, of course, you're not wanting to do either. So, so um, But look, we'll, 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 there are ramifications to decisions that council makes, and we ought to be able to tell you what the budget, budgetary implications of those decisions are, as we should with public transport. Yes. Okay. We, we only make decisions when they're put in front of us by staff. Yeah. So, and in fact, the public transport one was not an unexpected thing. It was bound to come up yeah. that the living wage thing comes before us or whatever. It was, we knew that in February. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't unexpected. And so, and because we don't come out and suddenly have rushed the blood, the blood to the head, about nothing. It's about a paper that you might have come back to us and said we could do this within budgets or we could do that. That's overspend and we overspend. But generally, if we can be told when we have a paper in front of us where where that money could come from or why it was so unexpected that we needed to do it or how how it's going to be sorted to get us in a balanced budget situation. Yeah, and I think we're talking. I think we're saying the same thing, Hillary. I think ultimately, for instance, if this council made a decision which was discussed yesterday around living wage for all of our contract staff, uh, that would have a budget implication clearly, and we would share with you what that budget implication was. So we might choose to put that off until the next financial year, just on the basis that we're not budgeted for it in this one. So that's the sort of information that I'd expect to give you when you're making decisions which have clear budget implication. Thank you. Also, any further questions on action yes. point? Yes, hello. Uh, Councillor Laws today. Sorry, I had my hand up. 
Yeah, that's that's good. I was just cut. I had to look to the screen to see it up there. It's bright yellow. Thank you. No, good on you. Thanks, mate. Your, your question. Um, I, I just want to make sure I'm in the right area. Um, can I discuss uh, the statement of comprehensive revenue and expense? Uh, we're not on. We're on actions register. Actions register. Oh, sorry. We're only on the actions register. Uh, but we will come to that, and you'll be most welcome to put your hand back up and talk oh, well, to I, that. You know, you know now that I, I want to. Thank you. Thank you. Good. That's awesome. I just wondered if we could have the update on the matter that is not on the action register that should be. Uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Donnelly, uh, I referred to you. Uh, re, there is an action that is, has somehow slipped off the screen, which is the, the rating reviews for, for drainage and flood and drainage schemes. Um, did you have any luck in locating that action? Uh, I haven't. Um, I think I did have a look at the um, the actions that I've got on my screen in the in Doc Assembler, which is what pulls the agenda together. And there's actually a couple of actions that I've got that haven't made it onto the list. So I think there's been um, something go on in the um, in the production of the uh, of the actual action list for the agenda, and one or two have dropped off. But the um, the Tyree flood and drainage one is still um, sitting there in the action list that I've got. Um, there hasn't been an update on that since the um, update that we gave at the previous um, at the previous uh, finance committee meeting, which was in May. Um, and um, uh, or, but I hadn't updated it because what's um, what has happened since then is uh, the. Um, engineering and hazards team had um, produced a draft video of um, of the scheme, and I believe it, you know, had um, emailed it to you, Kevin, as the yep. chair of that working group. So it was sitting there with, um, you know, I think you were going to circulate it to the other members and determine what the action was um, going forward from there. That'll be good. So I'll take that on board. That I will talk with CE and yourself to pull together a quick meeting of that working party to get that next stage sorted. Council Council was well, that wasn't the action that was asked for at no. the working party, and that's. Uh, I just understand. want to note that that there seems to be an issue that actions that were uh, sought haven't yet happened, and on an alternative. Solution may be the answer, but it should actually have gone through a working party. Uh, correct. And that's why I think we need to call that yeah. meeting to, to get right. that clarified. And could we have it back on the register? So it turns yes, up. Yes. What, what were the Mr. other matters that weren't? Mr. Donnelly, did you, did you say there was one other one that slipped off, Nick? Um, yeah, I, I saw another one that was um, from the annual plan. To, Liberations around reporting any cost savings. It's actually similar to that one that we already discussed around balancing the budget. Um, there was one around reporting any cost savings that was just that had just been updated that that will that will be happening as part of the quarterly reporting. Um, but I'd have to go through them and just you know line by line to see if there was any others. But certainly I had noticed that one and the Tyree flood and drainage one. Thank um, you. Yep. Any further on actions? We'll move to item 8.1 quarterly report. Uh, and we've got a couple of presenters, along with Mr. Donnelly, Sarah Monroe, and Jasmine Lamori. <clears throat> thanks very much for the report. And thanks for taking the time to come and present us. So this is our, our quarterly report for the uh, June quarter. Um, and Sarah, I'll just hand straight to you. Sure. So this is um, in the same format as how we normally give you your quarterly report. So the first section is the activity performance report, which Jasmine will run you through any questions that you've got there. And that's our performance on what our statement of service performance is from the long-term plan. And then you have from me um, an activity financial summary, it, um, and then a statement of comprehensive revenue and expenses, um, a statement of financial position, the treasury report, and then that detailed activity report. So we're happy to take any. Um, I, I'm assuming 
by um, Council of Laws question that we can take the paper as read and we're just happy to accept any questions. So, Councillor Scott first. Councillor Laws, will I just wait till we get to that section of the paper then I, I've definitely got your hand noted, but I'll just go to Councillor Scott in the first instance. Great, you know, good, clear report. <clears throat> Significant outcomes achieved, 42, 10 not achieved, 10 substantially achieved, two not able to be measured. Um, there are two issues that jump out for me. One was on page 28. Uh, yeah, the science report in the queen for May, that's the line or the protocol. And the other one, second item was on page 33, where river management uh, seemed to have red boxes not achieved all the quarters. And I just do wonder whether the target of 100% success. It's appropriate. So there's two questions here. Through the chair, I can, um, in terms of the science reports, my understanding is that the monitoring programs have been delivered as planned. It's just the part of that target which says we're going to report back to council by 30 June. That step hasn't happened. Yeah. So with the coastal program uh, report was brought to you in June 2021. Um, and they were expecting to bring that back in the before June 22, and that hasn't happened. So my understanding is that will happen sometime in, in the new financial year. You'll get the, an update on how that coastal programs uh, monitoring programs progressing. Um, the estuarine is that was that Brilliant. the yeah, yeah. Um, oh. yeah. So this is a finance report, but nevertheless, is there an explanation of why? Well, should there be an explanation of why that's a particular issue? I just don't have a meter here at the moment, is my problem. Uh, no. I'm not getting any other stuff looking like they know the answer. <laughs> no, no, it's no, no. <laughs> but just as a matter of interest, should, should there be, Mr. Through the Chair, should there be, you know, like if there's 10 red boxes, should there be an explanation of why they're red? Or if I, maybe it's there, maybe I've missed it. Uh, the, uh, the, through the chair, the, the coastal and the monitoring ones, we're saying we've substantially achieved them. So in terms of the measure in the LTP, it's to do the program, the auditors asked us to, to kind of add on that, I guess the checks and balances of saying not only are we going to do it, we're going to bring it back to council and um, explain what we've done. Yeah. And it's getting that bit back to you by 30 June which I think is, has just been a bit tricky with, with the estuary. Um, just as a matter of interest, if something's been substantially achieved, to my understanding is it's yellow, but this is red. Um, on, on which page? page? Oh, I'm on page 28. Yeah. Um, no. Okay, maybe, oh, God, I am wrong. It's the red one that's, the, so the, it's the red one that's not achieved. Yeah, so that's I the, do apologise. The change in approach of the land and water regional plan and it, it's it's just been a pivot of how we've worked through that program okay and it was the three fmu the modeling and so forth so, okay. yes i yep. apologize so page 33 my question is or have i have i got that right probably the first question <laughs> you know yeah. it, it, it's um it was river management there seems to be a lot of red boxes and there's a target of 100 percent should that be reviewed? I, I can end through the chair, probably. Um, that's uh, it, It's been a new measure for the 21-22 year. Um, the process getting off the ground in quarter one and two took them a while. So quarters three and four, they hit that 100% response rate. Also in quarter one, we had a level four lockdown. So that may also have... Um, Kind of made it, uh, yeah. I, I think that's a consideration. Um, and I think if we look at quarter two, uh, three, and four, the fact that they're hitting that hundred um, percent is uh, could give us some confidence in that. But we will revisit all the measures for the year three LTP um, over the course of this year with the annual planning process. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
So, Councillor so, Scott, what you're probably saying is, uh, if I read it right, we, we, we have got a sequence, of especially of red dots, that will yeah. give some explanation as to why they are red. And clearly, just the we reporting back one uh, on the, the coastal issue is actually quite minor, but yeah. it still does come up red. Yeah. Um, probably uh, another one that comes up like right that is like Goimas quite regularly is yeah. because we don't, have, yeah. yeah, within that the time frame that we have to do, we might miss one out of. Yeah. I don't know how many we get, but it seems to be an answer, but we've actually failed. Oh, but really, the explanation yeah. yeah. Uh, Through the chair, I just want, want to say on, on the page, my page numbers are different from yours, but there is a note um, yep. around, oh, there, I guess there's not much of an explanation, just saying that the river response targets weren't met in Q1 and 2. So that's on, I don't know what page, that, 29, 29, 29, 29 yeah. yeah. But yeah. they're back on track from there, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Hey, thank you for your response. Uh, Nick, Councillor okay. Scott on this same form. I'm oh, sorry, Councillor Wilson. <laughs> I was going on. Yeah, I knew well, what I was hitting. Yeah, I'm, I'm, my questions were on the same issue, uh, the river management ones, and um, I was reading it differently because there's four, four we've yeah. never, not one quarter we managed to yeah. achieve that. And on page 33, which is your page, uh, there's four quarters of reds. Yeah. Um, through the chair that we're reporting on a whether or not we're going to meet the target at yeah. year end. The fact that we failed in Q1 means that you're always, always okay. You're always always right. Okay, that's fine. Oh, on the right. next one, yeah. on the next one, and this is these are small lines sometimes, and there's the importance of some of this work to the community is lost by the fact that there may not be a lot of writing, and therefore yeah. they look like small boxes. Um, we've got a mandate, we take rates off people to do uh, river management work. There's a huge interest in certain FMUs to that work being done. How do we translate that as we slowly go down here and not achieving it, that the community are aware why those problems are yep. and when it's going to happen? So this is where we've discussed and somewhere in the actions that I didn't talk about is having a um, process where, where we tell people what the action plans are, where that investment is going to be going into. I think we've talked about that. How, how are we telling the people out in the community that actually this work isn't happening? I know it's slightly beyond yours, but it's... I would defer to Dr okay. Palmer on that one. Thanks, <laughs> Well, I'm not sure. Oh, here's Dr Palmer is coming online. <laughs> yes, sir, Mr Chair, the, the measure here is about timely communication to people. And so um, we, we haven't hit the 100% because we haven't done it within the 20 working days. What we have done is made sure we have communicated to everybody. So everybody's informed. We just haven't met the timeliness target. But we'll have more detail around this in our report to Implementation Committee on a River Management Activity. We'll give you more detail at that committee. Thank, Thank you. you. Come forward with that, Council also. Yeah. We'll get that report more in depth. Thank you. Any further questions on this report? Uh, yes. Yes, uh, Councillor Laws. Well, actually, I, I did want to just, you've raised the Lagoima issue, and uh, as you note, there are four red boxes. Um, listen, I'm not complaining, but I'm just saying that doesn't tell me if we've got a problem or not. The Ombudsman has had a real go at the public and local government sectors for routinely ignoring the law in terms of responding to local government official information requests as well as, well as OIAs. Um, what's the problem? Why have we got four red boxes? I, I can answer that one. Yep. Um, tr Kevin, through the... Yes. Through, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yep. No problem. Because the, the GOIMA sits with, um, sits with legal that sits with me. So... Um, so what you got there, same as um, as the other one that got pointed out, is that it's not that we've um, it, it's a year end target, so we've we've got to be one hundred percent compliant. So if we actually miss uh, the target in Q one, then we'll always it'll be missed in every um, every quarter thereafter because um, it's a full year. But what we had over this year is we had two Lagoima requests. That didn't meet the um, 20 day time frame for responding. Um, the reason that um, that didn't happen is neither of them were forwarded to the um, to the legal team to follow the process um, before that 20 days had already expired. And then, of course, there was an inquiry by the person as to why they hadn't heard anything. 
And at that point, we'd already missed the um, 20 days. So that was just all it was, was it's not that we weren't uh, responding or that we, and obviously those ones, we responded, um, you know, immediately once we, um, once we knew that those requests had been made. But um, it was simply a process issue that the people who received those um, had either inadvertently missed them or they hadn't forwarded them to the legal team. And as I said, that was two out of the hundreds that we're, um, that we're dealing with. So um, I, it, what we've done to action that is uh, we've just reiterated, make sure that um, everybody is aware of the procedure, which is as soon as a Lagoima request is received, it goes to the legal team, they log it, um, they have a they have a um, register and they are maintaining that and ensuring that the that the statutory time frame is um, is met. I wonder if we couldn't then change the reporting, Nick, because if you look at it, if you essentially if you explain, if you stuffed up the first one, you've stuffed up the year, so you have read right across the line. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. But but it's you know when we do the when we do the statement of service performance. It's like that for a lot of the targets. They're a target for us to achieve over the whole year. So we're saying over the whole year, we, we want to be 100% compliant, make sure that we respond to all of these. So yeah, unfortunately we could have actually gone, if it had have happened in the last quarter of the year, we could have gone green, 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 and then all of a sudden had a red. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It doesn't, yeah. make, it, doesn't make it any better from our point of view than the fact that it happened in the first quarter and we were red for the no, for but but it's a yeah. more accurate report Mike, because at Michael, the moment... Michael, sorry. if I could just take it a page, or it's on our page 27, which actually... Oh, it's our page 31, yeah, it's the top of page 31. Yeah, so, so it says we've done 121 out of 124 have responded in the correct time frame, which is 97.5%. So while we still get a red tag, we've done... The, yeah, that, that does show that we're actually doing a pretty pretty jolly good job. And well, can I ask, ask the next question? If having... having given a few Lagoimas in my time, if, and, and had extensions of time asked, if an extension of time is sought, so for example, under the Act, you can say, sorry, we can't meet the 20 working days, we are seek we're gonna tell you, we're gonna do an extension of time, it might be 10 days or something like that. Does that get listed as a red or a green, Nick? Uh, if, we, um, if we do the extension, which is you know part of the um, statutory process, and we're allowed to do that, still that counts as a green, right. um, because because that we're allowed to. It's the same in the consent space where they have um, time frames, but um, you know if, if if they've got to request more information, basically the that time um, frame goes on hold while that's um, the you know the <coughs> consent applicant goes away and um, provides the the further information. Okay, thanks. Comfortable. Could I further questions? Yeah, further to that. Ahead. Could I ask two things? The first thing is I understand that from my um, interaction with Lagoimas too, um, that part of that can be a staff training thing because a Lagoima isn't just something that somebody sends in under a local government request. Mm -hmm. If it is a request, that could be a Lagoima. I mean, if it, so, somebody might just send in a request mm -hmm. and a staff member may not recognise that it's a Lagoima and it still is. So, that part of it, am I right there? Is that Absolutely. a Absolutely. No, yeah. no, but we've done, I don't think there would be too many staff who haven't had that training. Yeah. So, we're well aware that all requests of information are treated as Lagoimas with an ORC. Actually, we're, we seem to be more thorough than I've been used to in other organisations, frankly. And the second thing is that it seems to me there's a good, and because we're good at it, probably James is doing a great job at his end, and I, from what I've seen he is. Um, we could be looking at it, couldn't we, on day 18 at the maximum and just making sure that we're, if we knew on day 18 that we had a problem, we can actually do something that, that we can't do on day 21, isn't it? Well, um, <laughs> the requirement is 20 working days. And I know, so, so. So, uh, As Nick's just explained, if there's a genuine reason for why we can't get the request completed in the 20 working days, then we can, then we can put the clock on hold. But there has to be a genuine reason. We can't just simply ask for an extension. No, but we can ask them whether they mind. The, 
person. Uh, we actually. can do that. Yeah, we could. Um, I think we do actually. Um, although this, it's happened so rarely in this organisation, but, but if, if we know we're going over the 20 days, then we would contact the people. But we can do that. What I'm saying is we can do that, can't we, on day 18, whereas on day 21, we cannot. We are over yep. our limit. So we yep. can't on day 21 suddenly decide we want anything. We're done. So if, if on day 18, all of them are looked at to make sure yep. that the options that we won't have in three working days, is that... And I'm pretty sure that's what we our yeah. process is very yeah. similar to that, actually. Yeah. 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 yeah, that is that is the process. That's exactly what the legal team are managing to make sure that and they send out reminders to the staff who are meant to be responding so that so that they can reply um, within that 20 days or um, you know, as through the statutory process um ask for an extension. Um, so it's it, that that's what's um that's what's happening. I think one of the example you gave about the about the training thing, one of those examples I think was exactly what you'd sort of outlined that a request came in, a staff member didn't interpret it as a Lagoima request, even though and and it was. Um, so that's why they hadn't responded. And then when it got followed up, obviously it then made its way to legal and they said yes it was and we should have had it on the clock, you know. Um earlier than what, what happened. So again, that as you pointed out, that's a staff training issue. So staff training about what is and isn't a Lagoima and the process to follow. Um, yeah, we're constantly, you know, working with that to make sure. Yeah, our aim is, um, you know, that you could look at the percentage and go, oh, it's still very high, but our aim is still to have that green and be 100% compliant. Thanks, Nick. Thank you. Uh, moving on to, uh, and thanks, Desmond, I much appreciate it. Activity financial summary. Any questions on that report? If not, we'll move on to the statement Is of comprehensive oh, yeah, revenue sorry. and expenses. And yes. I understand that you, Councillor Laws, has, have a question on that. Probably, probably got more than one, to be fair. That's um, pretty good memory. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um, I'll just turn, you, turn myself up. I've got a dog barking. My apologies. Um, can I take you to page 45 um, and the bullet points there, decreases of $3.6 million in supplies and services. Yesterday I asked a question about how much money we're saving if we don't actually get the bus services that we contracted for. Remember that? Because we were talking about how much money extra it's going to cost to meet the living wage for bus drivers. And that was calculated about a half a million dollars. If I take you down to bullet point two and three of that one, it says 1.486 thousand or 1.4 million, almost 1.5 decrease in Wakatipu public transport due to missed bus trips, reducing the cost of bus contractors. And then right under it says 1.6 to do with the need, which is what three point or near enough to 3.2 million dollars. Have I got that right in suggesting that that's money we've saved? Uh, well, Gavin, do you want to answer that? Yeah. Well, do you, want, do you want me to answer that? Because I think the the <laughs> um, one of the keys here is go back to, if you actually go back to page 35, you can see the, the two lines with the revenue as well. Because as, um, as you pointed out, as that um, page 45 points out, that's the saving in the bus contract cost, offsetting that is a revenue decrease. Um, and there is some other things in PT Dunedin or, and, and PT Wakatipu around. Um, we've got ferries in um, Queenstown. We've got business cases and other things that are um, going on. But um, yes, there is a savings from uh, not actually running the services. But on the flip side, if you go back to page 35, we're also down in revenue. So the key thing to look at, if you look at page 35, say for PT Dunedin, is we ended up, and this is not just the bus services, it's all the um, associated costs um, that we have going into the PT Dunedin, which is paid for by the Dunedin targeted ratepayer. We actually ended up one and a half million down on revenue because obviously we ended up, if you're running less services, then you get less bus fares. And we also had in there the cost of... Um, of uh, having lower, you're going to the $2 fare as well. Um, subsequently went to $1, but, $1, but um, 
Waka Kotahi was funding that shortfall. So we ended up in Dunedin, if you look on page 35, $1.5 million down in revenue, um, just under a million dollars down in total cost because there, you know, there wasn't um, some of that other spend um, had come back. So we actually ended up, although we saved a lot of money on the bus contract um, costs themselves, we actually ended up half a million dollars worse off in terms of deficit in PT Dunedin. Um, it actually worked out a little bit different in Queenstown. Yeah. Uh, we actually ended up with a little bit of a surplus. That's largely because the, um, because the ferry costs that we budgeted didn't come through that way. Um, if that hadn't happened, just the underlying bus service, I believe, would have had a similar story to um, to the um, to the situation in Dunedin. So it's not as simple as just saying, "Oh, we've saved money on the cost of the bus service," because there's a revenue impact, and overall, we were half a million dollars worse off in terms of um, what the the deficit we thought we were going to have in PT Dunedin. The other thing, if you look at just the pure surplus not the variance, which was half a million worse, we ended up with a $2 million deficit in PT Dunedin. So there was $2 million worth of cost we didn't fund. Um, again, that's the same story as the year before where COVID was impacting. So over these last year and the year before, we added $4 million to the deficit, the reserve deficit in Dunedin. Um, so that's just sort of what you have to bear in mind. You could sort of say, oh, we saved $1.6 million, but you didn't really. We, we were still $2 million short in our funding in the overall service in Dunedin. So, so $2 million of that or is because you're not providing the service, you're not getting the revenue, right? Or well, 1.5 of it is because you're not getting the revenue, Nick. Uh, yeah, well, the 1.5, we were 1.5 million short in revenue, which is a combination of, of fair revenue and, you know, Waka Kotahi grants, because obviously, um, you know, they, they'll only match, they, you know, they're, they're matching our share of the funding for most, okay. of, most of it. All right. Yep. So, so in, in other words, in Dunedin, you're saying the situation is much worse than, than, than is portrayed by just that bullet point. But in Waka Tipu, it's much better. Do we give them a... We've rated for these. In Wakatipu, we have, we're ahead of the game. So we've saved more money than we've spent even after we take everything into being. Does that money get accrued then to the Wakatipu rate players, or particularly Queenstown, and defray or defer their public transport costs or their rates component costs for the 22-23 financial year? Um, it it goes into um, it goes in against the um, against the reserve for PT in Queenstown, so those ratepayers will get the benefit. But that that reserve is already in deficit. So although now they're actually um, four hundred thousand better off than what we were forecasting, they're still in deficit. So we don't adjust the rates in this one year to reflect that, because the other thing is. Well, like I said, one of the reasons why that um, has come out better is because because um, of what were uh, the actual costs that came through for the water ferries. Where I think we were planning to have that fully brought on to you know part of our subsidised services, but we're still just funding it, um, doing a net contribution. So um, at some point, when when Queenstown gets fully back up operational and water ferries are in, um, you'll see a marked increase in the cost and that deficit will actually um, start increasing. So the fact that we've, um, that we've gained 400,000 is really just timing. Um, and it might mean that when we go and reset the rates and the increases in the next LTP, we can um, actually pull them back a bit then, but certainly, this year that we've just started, we just leave them as they were set in the LTP. Okay. Um, and the other issue was page 44, number five, um, top, relates to legal expenses the council's incurred. Uh, they've increased by just under a million dollars compared to the budgeted costs of 1.2. And then they're broken down into what those 
legal costs are. Um, the question I guess I would have of you is are you intending next year when you do the annual plan to build an additional revenue for legal costs, recognizing that that's quite a discrepancy? Um, the, the simple answer for that is, it, no, we don't. It depends on, on which um, activity they were incurred in and whether or not, um, if, you know, how that's funded. So in some of those cases, like if you take the top two, um, you know, incident response um, legal expenses, which will be around prosecutions largely, um, and then you've got the RPS, um, they're general rate funded. We may or may not end up with um, getting fines revenue, um, but there's usually a timing difference across years for some of the um, you know, prosecution and incident response. Um, things like the RPS is general rate funded. So effectively, that will just be absorbed by the general reserve this year. Some other things, if it's in um, areas that have, you know, have uh, targeted rate funding, they've got reserves, so it will just go into those reserves and be, you know, funded, you know, pulled back um, over rates over time. But the general reserve is um, once, you know, that would get used. Um, it's the sort of thing that if you know that that's there, I mean, we've already set the rates for this year, but we could go and, and look at adding that back into future years. But when you've already got significant in rates increases forecast over the last few years with those sort of costs, they've just been absorbed um, permanently by the general reserve. And I'm assuming that that last bullet point of $216,000 increase due to non-budgeted investigations, which is an awful lot of money, was, was mostly to do with the Clutha inquiry, was it? Yeah, that's what that would be. Yeah, that's what I I think that's for as well. Yep. So that would be is that correct, than... Sarah? Uh, yes, that is correct. Yeah. 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 So that would be mostly a one-off expenditure. Yeah. You yeah, hope so, anyhow. Does that okay. conclude your questions, Council yeah. Laws? Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. Oh, the, oh, there was just one other thing. I guess the thing that I was looking for in here, and I went looking for it. Patrick can point it out to me. Nick, yeah. Was I still don't know in terms of expenditure, budgeted expenditure whether our staff costs overall are up or down. So we remember we rated for additional staff. They're our primary cost to the organisation. Um, are we above or below in terms of expenditure on staff salaries that were budgeted for the financial year? Yeah, so the, that's where you want to go to the statement of comprehension comprehensive revenue and expenses so page 41 and that has there the the actual employee benefits expense so that's our staff cost uh, that was 26.6 million and the budget um, was 27.4 so we're actually 772,000 down underspent on that okay all right thanks Matt uh, Councillor Calvert um uh, this is a question for somewhere between Pim and Nick. Um, is it possible for you to look into for next year the X question that Councillor Laws has raised, sort of, uh, or sideswiped, um, which is that each year we spend several million dollars on legals and things and never do we rate for it. And that's on the basis, and I appreciate Nick's general position, which is that we don't know what they are and things, so we can't rate for something we don't know. But if we know that they're always $2 million, then somehow to balance the budget, we need to look in, at how we can rate for, for the expected but unknown what they are, legal and other such expenses. Can Is that something that you can... Presumably we budget for legal costs, Nick. Yeah, yeah, we do, and... Um... That I can't remember which page were we on um, oh, that uh, Council of Laws had pointed out. So the, yeah, page forty-four. Um, yeah, we we had um, legal expenses there. We budgeted for legal expenses of you know one point two four million. It was just that the actual 
legal expenses came out 952,000 above that. So, you know, there was things in there that, you know, we've, we've listed there where either the, either we hadn't budgeted for legal expenses in that area at all, or their quantum that we had um, was, uh, that we budgeted was less than what was actually incurred. Um, yeah. We Whether, legal you know, and planning and things, Nick, I'm not sure what totally they involve, but there's a couple of million dollars of things that we don't budget for somewhere in the middle of the year. So, so, anyway, I'm so, just sort so it's of part of forming that balanced budget. In, for the yes, next. inviting them to, and I do also understand that suddenly putting them in one year when you didn't last year, um, and you haven't ever before, has a rating effect. But not putting them in means that you're just keeping on running them at a deficit. So I'm just inviting them to look into that. I'll look into it. Uh, moving on to the Treasury report. Oh, so, statement of financial position. Sarah, do you want to make any commentary on those last three papers? Um, no, I would just like to say, if that's okay, for the statement of financial position, that does not have the fair value of port or our investment property included. So, um, when you review the annual report, obviously that position will be different because we do have those fair values included in there. So, I just wanted to highlight that to councillors. Excellent. Thank you, Sarah. Any further questions to those reports? And will the report be noted uh, along with the attachments? That recommend staff recommend the recommendation. The other attached reports. Yep. Certainly uh, moved by Councillor Andrew Noon. Seconded for that motion. Mm -hmm. Councillor Gretchen Robertson. Second. Mm -hmm. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Thank you very much indeed for that report. And thank you for the, the good debate around it. Moving on to 8.2. Happy to see you. Uh, introduced by Sarah and... <laughs> no, no, I'm happy. It, it is the same report that you receive <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. every year for yeah, me to do the company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to file it. Do change I do um, change yeah. the dates, obviously, <laughs> but um, it is a Companies Act um, requirement. So thank you very much. <laughs> so we have one, two, three, four, five, six recommendations. I'll move them. No, no we didn't. No, no. It was already done. <laughs> we didn't put my role all of that. Hand up. Yeah. Oh, he still got his hand up from, oh, yeah, that's from a half an hour ago. Oh, <laughs> Michael, your hands, you, you haven't got a question there, have you, sir? I have not. So didn't it go down? Okay. Yeah, that, that's right. No, no problem. Thank you. I, I'm watching it. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Devin. Thank you very much. What, all those in favour? Aye. 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 Let's get in. That's good. Yeah. Any go? So, so you, I suppose he comes up here once a year and does this, does he? <laughs> All right, we move on to item 8.3, which is our annual plan 2023-24 process on timetable. Uh, report author, Mr. Rossler, and endorsed by Mr. Donnelly. Um, I'll hand over to you, Mr. Rosler, to give us the highlights. Uh, thank package. you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you. Thanks, Mike. This, this report uh, is really just simply signalling uh, to the committee um, that we're beginning our review of um, the 23-24 uh, financial year, planning year, and being um, year three, final year of our current LTP. Um, it's best summed up by the diagram that you can see on page 60, um, and that'll be, that will have a familiar feel uh, to you all, hopefully. Um, and that's the same, the same steps and pretty much the same sorts of timing that you that you experienced in the last round that we've just that we've just, just adopted. Um, and the discussion part of the report really puts the explanation around those steps, which um, shouldn't be a surprise to you. I'd, I'd just really like to say that probably the key takeout um, in the report is that that identify step is, 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 is the um, local body elections landing right smack bang in the middle of it. So really the, the key that I think for this committee right now is that um, we'll come, staff will come back to the newly elected council to really land the specific dates um, um, within, the, within the steps that you see there. 
um, and, and the meeting formats that the council would prefer to discuss um, to, to discuss the planning conversation. The, the that, right players proved you're having a meeting on Monday night. You could go along to that to give a few ideas. Yeah, I bet. Um, but however, look, there is there is one timeline but that the that the diagram is highlighting, and that's that November, a November start date for the councils to go. We went for a very long walk. Michael Deca. Yes. Go oh, on, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Shall I, I continue? Yeah, yeah sorry. Right. I just, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so look, November is, uh, with the reports flag November is a, is a key month date to really engage, for the councillors to engage in the planning conversation. Um, you know, any, any later than that, and I'm suggesting that it puts a lot of pressure on elected reps and, and indeed staff to, to manage the process as well. So that's a bit of a, uh, a stake in the sand, if you like. Um, and, the, and the other bit um, is that uh, staff, um, from this point until we engage in November, staff will look to put together some presentation material um, around our current work program and the funding implications of that, uh, and, and indeed exploring some of those drivers of change that I've, I've heard that this meeting actually you've started talking about some of those. So staff will be doing uh, some substantive thinking around that and be bringing back some presentation material in preparation for when you engage uh, as a new council. So thank you, Mr Chair. Questions, Councillor Walson. Two questions. Um, one is, and thank you for picking up as the resolution was that, that some of these matters and taking them forward. Really grateful for that because of us remembering that stuff is torturous. Um, but, but you've also heard the one today about Enviro schools, which could have a double whammy. Um, most of I think that. So that, and thank you, for Andrew, for reporting back on that um, because it's one that I'm really passionate about. Is, is what is our, rea um, our relationship with the other TAs in continuing that conversation to ensure that if there is a, if they do put it in theirs, that it will be in ours. Because there is a, or is it all going to be in their budgets? And yeah, it's a bit of each, isn't it? Yeah, that report right, right. That, that's why I raised the question, yeah. red flag, there's a piece of work to do before we even get to that yeah. point that we're not currently funded for. Yeah. So it's not a case of just getting to the point where they say yes and, and this table says yes and because we, we haven't even done the work to determine that we, we put some indicative numbers in the yeah, report you yeah. to me is, but that's where the, the conversation and the timing of that becomes so important so we can get the right information in front of you. Yeah, um, well, may not be in front of me, but that's fine. Um, but yeah, no, and with all respect, I do think that that's one that the communities, um, or some communities want, and I, I, I just don't know how that's going to pan out. So I don't want to ask another report if they're not interested, that's the problem. Do we have to write to the actual individual TAs and say, are you going to consult on this? Or are you looking at putting money in your budget? Can I just suggest that uh, the mayoral forum, uh, when I was, go back to the minutes, there was obviously a, a direction about circulating yep. that report as background information. And I'm, I can't recall what other action that the mayoral forum resolved to do, but that's probably the starting point yep. to just understand uh, you know, where to from that point. So. I think it's quite urgent that we get something back. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and the other one is, and I have to say that this is the saddest line I've seen in a report of a Ford Focus Council, and it's in most of our reports, so I shouldn't really be hard on you, but climate change considerations. We've just employed a Francesco, um, and he's doing a fantastic job, and it's obviously got a lot of ideas about what may come up. I would have hoped, and I don't know, are you contemplating that we will have, and I, I mean, even the conversation we've had about electric cars and whatever else we might be doing, whether it's electric buses as well. Um, is there, at what point do we need to put something in here about being potentially more ambitious on our climate change budget? Mr. Yep. Um, so, so this, <laughs> no, and that, that's a good question. Look, this this report is process focused, yeah. and what I can absolutely say is that, and sorry if it sounds like sucking eggs sort of answer, but 
it is an activity within our planning structure and therefore has to be part yeah. of our conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it does sound a bit glib down in the climate change section which it says no action. But for this process, yes, that's true. But when, when, we're, when we're implementing it we, and the information we bring back to council, there is a section there, as you know, about climate yeah. change and that's where the conversation that you're yeah. alluding to can occur. So it's time if he comes up with things that needs more money that that will be in there? Well, the, the more money, but I, I don't know, but yeah. that there's certainly a conversation to be well, had that yeah. is driven by um, the information that we bring, the advice we bring and, and the political position that councillors have and bring, to, and bring to the table and that will definitely occur. Yeah, and that can also be reinforced in that um, October-November period where council is, we, we are seeking um, influence and discussion from the council Calvert. Um, is it? I presume we do it, but I'm not sure whether it's piecemeal or, or more structured than that. Two things. One is here's some issues that we can get the feeling of us coming up, but either they've been raised and haven't got very far but are coming, mm. Um, and so what appetite do you have for getting those into the next part of the process? So that's one set of things. And another set of things is what interactions have we had with other people, be they territorial authorities or whatever? Here's a list of what interactions we have with them. Do they have any suggested sense of direction or something such as that we can pick up the possibility of that needing to be thought of as budgetary for us for the future. So here is not, and some of that would be mural forum or mm -hmm. something, and some of it will be from the Climate Alliance thing or something, but we have a variety of different interactions, and I'm presuming somebody can pick those up and say, here's a list of them, and here's the sort of things they're doing, and this is the sort of budgetary ideas they might you know, is that is that something that we have a sort of? Well, we have some joint projects with probably a number of TAs. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of Dunedin City, for instance. We've got the future um, uh, Dunedin strategy. Um, we've got the South Dunedin, a few uh, South Dunedin um, project. So some of those projects which we're working on together with other TAs, we are budgeting for because we've got projects around them already. So do we have a list of what all of them are? So no, as we can could then... pull a list together and, and yep. then... Um, that would be quite useful, I think. Yeah, my gut feeling is other than a couple of those really big projects, we probably don't spend a lot of our budget on, on partnership work with other TAs. Um, largely our budget spent on things that, we, that we're providing for our, for our rat payers. And we may or may not want to even having yeah. that list in front yeah. of people. Well, we can easily produce yeah. the list, sure. Yeah. Thank you. And probably just a comment. Uh, you had a question. I was going to move the recommendation. Oh, can I just put a wee statement in first? Look, 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 I know in that October, November period, and in, in my short time here, um, one thing that I have noticed is there does seem to be public stuff coming in that March, May period when probably it's too late for that year. So I wonder if there is a mechanism that we can either job the people around, the, the councils around the table, or in fact the public, that the, the annual plan process is actually starting is starting in November. Just, just a I, thought. I, I, look, I, I'm, I'm excited that you're talking about strategic stakeholders because I, when I brought my report to you in February, um, that's exactly what I had in mind. Yep. So this is, this is music to my ears. And, and I'm sitting here thinking around how we'll actually implement this. It's, it's a great suggestion and it's a good one. Um, and, it can, and, and yes, it's going to be done. Um, and, you know, it could look like the, the package of information that comes to you in, say, November, if that's what the weather new council wants to start engaging, fingers crossed, um, it will include a stakeholder part of it, a strategic stakeholder part of it. And you can, and as you say, Hira, you can, the new councillors can see that and then um, and just have discussions around it. Like it might be. What, what, what is something missing there? Like Should a we... carbon neutral thing outside oh. Dunedin, as Councillor Moores was saying, why just Dunedin? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you might look at that and think, oh, there's a gap here, it just says Dunedin mm -hmm. and where Otago will. Well, Councillor Wilson. Um, this is a much more difficult one question, and it's about the ICM work. We're going out um, with... Integrated catchment management, sorry, I shouldn't be using 
acronyms. Um, we're going out with a land and water plan, and in that planning, there's a re that's the regulatory plan, and alongside that are going to be action plans, but they're knitted together to deliver the ambitions of the community in those catchments. What we haven't done is fund the ICE, the integrated catchment managements in such a way that they can knit together particularly well. There's, they, go, they go for some years before some catchments get any money. Now, the problem with that is if we're going out with a land and water regional plan that's regulatory and we've got no commitment in our books for the non-regulatory stuff, we have got a disconnect with our community and that social licence that we're trying to do. That makes sense to you, Michael? Sort of? Well, I'm, I'm, it's not my area of no, my, okay, my yeah. function, but process-wise, it's same as climate change. Yes. There'll, be a, there'll be a discussion on, on ICM yeah. as there was in the last plan yeah, yeah. process. I, I think my problem is that, again, because I may not be around the table again, is that I'm highlighting for those that may be here that that disconnect may need to be fixed in the next long-term plan if we're going to get the best out of the land and water plan yeah. and get the best engagement. And it's come very clearly in my head that we're not selling them both together, but they need to be sold together. And um, yeah, I'm just, just putting that out there that I don't know how you're going to do that. It will be a significant budget increase potentially because if you're going to do some of that stuff more, more quickly, otherwise you're going to slow down that development of the land and water plan. It depends on which work needs to be done. But yeah. yeah. Gavin, did you want to talk at all to the integrated catchment management plan? Uh, well, we're bringing an update on the framework back to you at the end of next month. But we do already, we we do we are presently doing non-reg work. For example, to Hakapupu, Lake Hayes are examples of non-regulatory interventions to do with freshwater. Um, but I, but we take the point around aligning ICM work with the land and water plan stuff. Yeah, yeah, and, and presumably if, if the council, uh, as part of that conversation that Mike's been alluding to, Gavin, were keen to invest more in the in the action plans that drop out of the uh, out of the uh, integrated catchment management planning process, the action plans, if they need more funding, then that's presumably part of that conversation mm -hmm. that we'll have around the budget for yeah. the next two years. We'll just need. Uh, council Laws, you had a question, or is that just my keeping that hand up? No. Councillor Forbes, you were waving. You're good. No, Councils I'm. I'm sorry. I my apologies. I've my, my computer freeze froze. Yes, I move two recommendations. Councillor Scott, I, move. Please ask me a question. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, unmute. Yeah, sorry, Mr. Councillor Laws. Um, I'm referring to page fifty six, fifty seven. I uh, hope you haven't skipped past that. Sorry, I just had to deal with the dog. Um, Communication and engagement, and so that's the three bullet points at the top of page 57. Um, it says we need to use an open engagement process to build relationship ownerships of issues, solutions, trust, understanding, etc. cetera. Um, will we at some stage, because I think it's really critical, have a communication strategy or plan that attends this process? And when do we get an access into that? Mr. Rothwell. Uh, so, so, uh, uh, Richard, you might be allowed to listen. Yeah, um, Mike, Mike can probably add as well, but I think each year um, Mike has brought the communications plan to council um, that sits alongside the either the annual plan, certainly the long-term plan. So I guess, um, Michael, the answer is yes. I would expect that to form far, part of this process as well. Um, that councils will have a chance to input into whatever communication goes out on the annual plan and, and how that goes out. Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, because one of the things that um, we tend to do is get that late, Richard, and I was yeah. sort of hoping that we might be able to get it early, if you know what I mean, and then get some input into it then. Yep. That's Thank fine. you, Council Laws, and we, we've had the motion moved by Council Scott. Twice. Twice. A seconder. Councillor Wilson, all those in favour, 
Aye. 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 Motion carried. Just what I'll just make the point that the dates that you have in your uh, steps and timing, uh, if you could re remember to continually reinforce to us that we're missing some of those dates, the pressure that it puts on everywhere. So, uh, which you, I, I found you did really, really well uh, last year and kept us on our toes. So, uh, we appreciate that yeah. guidance. Thank you. Yeah, and look, look and I, I, I'll just say November, and um, if, if we really need to get cracking <laughs> early November for you know for the councillors around the table and keep getting the pressure off you guys in terms of the decisions you might be looking at. Um, it's going to be a good one. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mike. Thank, Thank you. you. And I'll move from the chair at this stage. We move into publicly excluded. Seconded. Seconded by Councillor Wilson. Aye. 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 Aye.